Hi, everyone. I hope you all had a good holiday weekend. Um, I'll admit I was relaxing a bit or trying to as much as we can these days. So I've had some really great questions about the quiz. Okay, so first off, relax. Remember that the quiz is just meant to show you what the exams will be like. So it's kind of like a preview. Okay, please also remember that you have four quizzes altogether. Okay, so the whole purpose of them is to get you geared up and ready for the exams and um, to kind of give you a practice run. And they're not meant to be stressful. Some other good questions I've had. Don't forget you get 48 hours from the moment I release the quiz until the quiz is due. I want to give you lots of time to go over it. Okay, please, please, please don't wait until the last hour before it's due. Okay, you guys can open it up, take a look at the questions, answer a couple, jot down some notes, leave for a little while, come back, finish it. That's entirely up to you, but don't wait until the last minute, okay, because that just makes everybody sad. The other things you need to remember is that what I'm asking you to do is to use the lectures as the basis for your answers, okay? And also, when you do, you need to tell me the lecture number you got it from and the slide number you got it from, okay? And the reason for this is I don't want you guys going to Google your answers, <clears throat> not that anybody here would, and I want you can always um, add additional information from outside resources as long as they're reliable, but I want you to use the lectures as a place to start, okay? So what we're going to focus on now is how we actually date the history of life, which is actually really cool stuff. Okay, so you guys are young paleontologists, okay, and you're out on your first exploration. You find this really cool dinosaur fossil, okay? So what I want you to think about now is I want you to stop lecture, pause lecture, okay? Don't desert me completely. I want you to pause lecture, and I want you to think about what questions would you ask, okay? What would you want to know about this particular little dinosaur fossil? Well, one question you might ask is, how old is your dinosaur? Okay, so there are multiple ways you can address that question. The first one is to use what's called stratigraphy. Then you could use biostratigraphy. And then you could use geochronology. Okay, so remember, stratigraphy came from who? William Strata Smith. Does that ring a bell, I hope? If not, I'm going to be sad. <laughs> okay, stratigraphy is the study of strata. Okay, and so you're trying to figure out who existed when, remember, the older is at the bottom, younger is on top, and all sorts of other good stuff. Biostratigraphy is similar, but you're incorporating life. Remember, bio means life. Okay, so you're looking to see who lived older than your dinosaur, who lived younger than your dinosaur, all sorts of other good stuff. Okay, geochronology, now that's another interesting field. With geochronology, you're trying to look at the different types of rocks, and then you start incorporating how the rocks are formed, because that can tell you a little bit about the conditions that existed when your dinosaur was buried. Okay, so, and again, chronology keeping everything in order, remembering that this was a long, long time ago. Okay, so figuring out how old your dinosaur is definitely one of the questions you want to ask. Um, what type of dinosaur? What else lived at that time? There's all sorts of other good questions. Okay, so just keep thinking this in mind as we go through lecture. Now, there's all sorts of interesting scientists who contributed back in the day. Now, keep in mind, this is long, long, long time ago, and even older than me, as my husband would say. <laughs> okay. So, yes, I'm old. These guys were, would be older than me. Keep in mind, they're all dead, though. All right. So, Neil Stenson is the first one we'll talk about. All right. James Hutton is the next. William Strata Smith will revisit him. Charles Lyell will revisit him. And who can forget Charles Darwin? Okay, all sorts of good stuff there. So let's dive in. So Neil Stenson, otherwise known as Nicholas Stenow, okay, born in 1638, long, long time ago. So a lot of the knowledge we have in this day and age we take for granted. Okay, so, but what I want you to consider is we didn't always have this knowledge. And back in the day, a lot of people used to be really superstitious. One of Neil Stenson's biggest contributions was that he discovered what were known as, um, well, people used to find shark's teeth way back in the day along the shores. And they actually, though, believed that they were serpent tongues. Okay, so something coming from the Bible, I believe. I <clears throat> need to brush up on my studying of that. Anyway, so, <laughs> but what he discovered was that the, what were called these tongue stones or these serpent tongues were actually fossilized shark teeth, which is really pretty cool. Something I've always wanted to find on the coast, but I haven't yet, but that's one of those bucket list thingies I want to check off. Now, the way he discovered this, by the way, was because he was a scientist and he happened to be dissecting a shark's head. Okay, 
And as he was dissecting the shark's head, which he published eventually, he realized that the teeth of the shark looked a lot, lot uh, looked a lot like those tongue stones. Okay, and so once he kind of figured this out, he realized that you know sharks had actually been around for a really long time and left teeth all over the place, which meant that, you know, these teeth by that point in time were fossils, which were really, really old. And so you got to remember, this was starting to challenge the whole idea um, that the earth was really young, which is what people thought it at the time. Remember, we take this knowledge for granted now, knowing how old the earth is, but back in the day, people really weren't sure. The other thing I want you guys to realize is that he also studied stratigraphy, okay? So now this is one of the drawings from one of his books and what I, one of his papers. What I want you to do, we're going to start the opposite. I want you to go to the right and all the way down. You see a layer of strata, okay? And so that's how things started out. Well, groundwater rises, and this, by the way, happens in real life, and this is what he's drawing out. And it can actually make all of the strata layers except one on the top disappear. Sometimes it takes out everything. But in his example, it takes out all the bottom layers. Of course, there's no support, so then that top layer collapses. That's what the very first top diagram is meant to represent. Okay, now what I want, so we went from the very bottom right, which is all those strata layers. Then we go to the middle right, where the middle is washed out and there's no support. Then we go to the top right, where, of course, it collapses because there's no support. All right, now what I want you to do is go to the left and all the way to the bottom, okay? What will happen, of course, is this area will fill with new strata layers, okay? Go to the middle, and once again, you can have that washed out, and then go to the very top left, and as you'll see, they can collapse again, okay? Again, we take this knowledge for granted, but back in the day, people didn't realize this, okay? And so Steno had kind of figured out how layering happened, and how stratigraphy happened, and how the oldest were located at the bottom, but you could have these crazy things happen quite a bit. And so this was one of his biggest contributions, okay? So, and on the next slide, we'll talk about the four principles of stratigraphy that he actually came up with, which are actually quite brilliant. Okay, so let's talk about his four principles of stratigraphy, okay? The first principle is principle of superposition. And basically what this states is that the youngest strata are at the top and the oldest strata are at the bottom, all right? This is relatively um, easy, and of course, we take this for granted today. Okay, he came up with a second one as well, the principle of initial horizontality. So what this means is that strata are initially laid out in a horizontal manner. Okay, so strata are initially laid out in a horizontal manner. If you see anything angled or bent, that means that there's been tectonic pressure. Remember one of the slides we showed in, in lecture one? There's a lot of tectonic pressure that can distort that, but when they're laid out, they're going to follow the laws of gravity like everything else, and they'll be laid out horizontally. The third is the principle of strata continuity. What this means is initially strata are also laid out in a continuous manner. Okay, so initially strata are laid out in a continuous manner. That should make sense too. Now, last but not least, the principle of cross-cutting relationships. What this means is when you have one layer that's cutting across another one, whoever is doing the cutting tends to be the youngest, and whoever is being cut into tends to be the oldest. Okay, and generally that happens because the youngest is the top, and if it's going to, you know, something's going to disappear, support from the bottom, think about the figure we showed on um, the last slide, something's going to cut into something else, it's probably going to be the new ones cutting into the older ones. Okay, so when you guys are learning this material, um, unfortunately or fortunately for you, however you wish to look at it, one of my hobbies is figuring out how people learn. So I'm going to give you guys study tips throughout the course, okay? And even um, a lot of times I have students take this class that are not science majors. And that's great because I'm trying to convince you to come to the dark side of science because it's really cool. Along the way, I'm going to share study tips with you. Okay, these are things that I wish people had told me a long time ago when I was a, a student. So when you're trying to learn new material, you should rewrite something in your own words. Don't just memorize it, okay, and then spit it back out if I happen to ask you to define the four principles of stratigraphy. Okay, so I want you to twist it around in your brain, I want you to think about it, and I want you to write it in your own words. The reason for this is when you force your brain to do that, that means you're truly learning it. Okay, so rather than just memorize, memorizing it in context. Anyway, that's study hint number one. We will have many more throughout the semester. <laughs>
Okay, so hopefully you guys liked the video. Um, I realize having me ramble on the whole time gets kind of boring, so I'm trying to introduce additional things that I find interesting and informative. And I thought that video was one. And then the offhand chance it doesn't load, I will put it in the announcements for lecture today. Okay. The other thing Hutton came up with was the principle of uniformitarianism, and I think that was in the video. And basically this states that processes that happen today happened similarly in the past. Okay, so processes that happen today happened the same way in the past. And so basically this just means that, um, you know, things we see today are what you have to use and explain when you think about patterns that happened in the past, okay? So it's not as if there was any big magic wave of a magic wand and all of a sudden earth appeared and I'm not touching religion with a 10-foot pole because we're just talking about things that um, focus on science based on the scientific method, okay? So that's all we're focusing on in here, all right? And so given this information, um, this is one of the principles that, that Hutton actually proposed, which again, challenged, um, as the video said, challenged the church at the time. And back in the day, honestly, that was something most people didn't do, because if you did challenge conventional thought, a lot of times you got in trouble. But, you know, that's why we tend to look at things um, differently today was because of this information. Okay, and then we also have William Strata Smith. Don't forget, we talked about him earlier. And one of the ideas that he contributed, of course, was the principle of biotic succession. Okay, as he was studying these strata, he realized that there were certain patterns in life that also changed over time with the strata. So remember, the idea of the principle of biotic succession is that life also goes through the successional process, where you go from one type of life to the next to the next, okay? So that's what succession means, much like forests do. So remember, back in the day, people didn't think that the earth was very old, and they didn't think that things changed over time, okay? And that's just what everybody, that was their conventional thought. And so this was one of the big um, challenges to that, was realizing that the earth was actually much older than we thought, and in addition to that, realizing that um, uh, life changes and evolves they hadn't figured out the evolution whole idea yet, but that life actually does change over time as well. Now, Charles Lyell was a famous scientist back in the day, and he lived in the 1800s, and actually he was a friend of Charles Darwin. One of his biggest contributions, by the way, was that he wrote a book called The Principles of Geology. Now, this book was so famous and so popular that I think they reprinted it like 13 different times, which is kind of unheard of these days, okay? So, but people loved it so much and they used it so much that they just wanted it to be updated and wanted to keep reading it, which tells you a lot, you know, about how interesting uh, the book was and how meaningful it was to the scientific community back in the day. Okay, so Charles Darwin, of course, was one of the most famous scientists and one of the most controversial. So his contribution was coming up and, you know what, he actually wasn't the first one to come up with this, by the way. Other scientists and even his grandfather had written about natural selection evolution in so many words, um, you know, back in the day. But he was the first one to really publish on it, okay? So Darwin came up with the idea of natural selection, with the whole idea of evolution, and that realistically speaking, you needed vast amounts of time for critters to evolve, okay? But what he really contributed was the fact that he was explaining the mechanism behind biotic succession. So basically, he was giving the mechanism of how things change through time. Okay, and so, again, we take this knowledge for granted, but back in the day, this was a really big deal because of the fact that people didn't know this and they didn't realize it. And so um, that's one of the reasons that Darwin is remembered so strongly today. So let's talk about radiocarbon dating and when it started to get recognized that you could actually use this to get definitive dates on your fossils, okay? So when you need to, pause lecture and write things down, okay? So the first date of what I think is important for you guys to know is in 1896 when Henri Becquerel, and my French is appalling, I apologize, H-E-N-R-I, B-E-C-Q-U-E-R-E-L, and he discovered radioactivity, okay? The next big discovery, as far as this was concerned, is 1902, when Rutherford and Soddy, R-U-T-H-E-R-F-O-R-D, and then Soddy, S-O-D-D-Y, they're both just the last names, framed the atomic disintegration theory so that you could have unstable atoms that would degrade. That was a big deal, 
Okay. Next, we hit 1904. Rutherford described how the heat of the earth and the sun accounted for, were accounted for by radioactive decay. Did you guys know that? The reason we have so much heat in the middle of the earth as well as the sun is because of radioactivity, radioactive decay. Interesting, isn't it? All right, we're checking along through time. Now we're at 1905. And the next big discovery was made by two men whose last names are Boltwood, B-O-L-T-W-O-O-D, and Strutt, S-T-R-U-T-T. Basically, it was interesting because they dated various old rocks and they realized that they would get ages of 400 to 2,000 million years, otherwise 2 billion years. Okay, so this was the first chance that they actually could date these old rocks. Last but not least, 1911 through uh, 1927, Arthur Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S, produced the first calibrated geologic time scale. And this was a big deal because what it allowed people to do was to realize that um, different elements, isotopes, would decay at different rates consistently. Okay, and that's what allows us to determine these dates on all these different um, fossils. Now, before everybody panics because they see a mathematical formula, and I'm only saying this, by the way, because when I was in school and I saw a mathematical formula, I would usually completely panic. Um, and I don't want you guys doing this. I want you to realize it's just a formula. Nothing more, nothing less, okay? You're not expected to memorize it. Oh, how awful that would be. <laughs> but what I do want you to realize is just get an idea of how it's used. Okay, so let's talk about going across the top. The parent isotope, this is the unstable version. The stable daughter product, that's what it will decay into. Half-life, that's how long it takes for half of the isotope, unstable isotope to disintegrate. You should write that down. Half-life always means the amount of time it takes for half of the unstable isotope to disintegrate into the um, daughter product. Now, these are just examples, okay? But what it tells you is different parent isotopes will decay at different rates. And remember, it's pretty consistent, so you can kind of use it as a clock. Now let's look at that formula, okay? The one that I would have panicked over 20 something years ago if I'd seen it. <laughs> okay, so T is obviously time. All right, and so that's the age of the specimen. One over lambda. Lambda just means the decay constant, because remember we said each of these decays at a particular constant. Times the natural logarithm of one plus the amount of daughter isotope that you have divided by the amount of parent isotope that you have. Okay, what I want you to get from this is let's say you have a fossil and you want to get a date on it, and you have a whole bunch of daughter product and not much parent product. Would you have an old fossil or a young fossil? Well, in order to get a whole bunch of daughter product, it takes time. Okay, so that means a lot of time has gone by and so you have an old fossil. Whereas, let's contrast that, if you had a whole bunch of parent product, but not much daughter product, you'd have a relatively young fossil. Okay, because not much time has gone by for that fossil to decay yet, if that makes sense. All right, so if you guys understand this, then you're doing great, okay? And that's all I really expect you to get out of this, is just to realize what the, how the formula is used, what you would expect, okay? And um, realize that this is the basis for radioactive, um, radio, radiometric dating and isotopes and so forth. And why it's so cool, because this lets you actually get a date on things that are incredibly old and much older than even I will ever be, <laughs> at least according to my husband. <laughs> Just so we're clear, by the way, when I do get flack from my husband, I usually um, involves getting a dish rag thrown his way. So it's not as if I don't get even, okay? So there's more examples of radiometric dating, and I want you guys to look some up. One is carbon-14. Another is lead, okay? So I want you guys to come up with some examples of the radioactive parent, which is unstable, then the stable daughter, and then the half-lives. And before anybody panics and says, how in the world do I do this? You guys are like the, the experts when it comes to using online Google, okay? Or DuckDuckGo or whichever um, of those you wish to use. Now I want you to come up with, let's say, two to three more examples, okay? And then once you do, you'll be good to go. Now let's look at our little dinosaur fossil again, okay? So remember, it's over in the rock. And so this to the left is an actual picture, and to the right is a diagram. 
which kind of shows you um, what the rock formation looks like and how the strata happen to be formed, you know, happen to be laid down, or at least how they're shown here, knowing that some of it's obviously eroded and so forth. And what I want you to do now, hint, hint, do this, okay? I want you to think about those questions that we asked in the very beginning, and then given the information and lecture that we've gone over, I want you to use that information to find out your things about your dinosaur. So things like stratigraphy, things like biochronology, okay, things like natural selection evolution, like how do you find information? Go back to those questions and apply that information that we talked about, okay, and then be able to come up with um, answers to those questions that you, were, that you asked in the very, very beginning. Okay, now hopefully you guys went back and thought through it for yourself because um, that's how you really learn much better than me just yammering stuff at you. But I figure since we're not actually sitting in class together, I will make sure you're relaxed about this and not panicking. Okay, so let's go back to some of the questions I asked, and then let's think about what we would use to figure it out. So one of the first questions we want to know, how old is our dinosaur? Okay, so how could we figure this out? Radiometric dating. Okay. Now, another thing we wanted to know is what species is our dinosaur? Okay, and if you will recall, when it came to different species, okay, so... Um, we talked about um, biostratigraphy, who existed through time, okay? Also, paleobiology, making comparisons with other fossils and all sorts of other good stuff. We also talked about geochronology, okay, how rocks are formed. So, something that's interesting here, by the way, and the reason these two diagrams have been actually popped up is something I want you to notice is if you look at that box where the fossil happens to be located, um, the strata are not perfect and not continuous. This means there's been some erosion there, so you would actually have to be careful when you're dating your fossil. So you wouldn't want to take a bunch of soil from right above it to figure out the date. You need to take soil right at the le or rock sample at the, at the level of your dinosaur to make sure you get the proper date. Okay, And then to realize that your strata are not perfectly horizontal, and they're definitely not 100% continuous, so there's been some tectonic activity here. All right, but that at least gives you an idea of what type of information you can you can ask with regards to your little fossil. Additionally, if you happen to sample the strata that your fossil is in, you can also maybe dig up some pollen fossils, which would tell you what type of plants existed back then. Or maybe there's other animal fossils, which tell you what other critters existed then. Okay. By the way, all of these are things that actual paleo... Um, people have to deal with, paleontologists and paleobotanists and so forth, have to deal with as they're trying to piece together the history of life, okay? So you have limitations in what you can ask, but you also can get a lot of information provided you're careful about how you gather it. Okay, so we have talked about how fossils are formed previously, but what I want you to consider is how they would be formed potentially here and where they would be located. So shark's teeth, could be located just about anywhere, most likely in the depths of a you know ocean. Okay, you could also find some clamshells there. As you get closer to shore, you could potentially find clamshells still, but maybe like pollen grains. Okay, and then if you happen to be in a river, and you might um, come up with some pollen grains as well, but you also might find some uh, elk uh, skulls and so forth because you're in more terrestrial areas. The other thing I want you to consider is that land has changed drastically over time. So areas that are a desert now might have actually been under the ocean previously. Okay, It's just the way plate tectonics works, and it's just the way that um, you know everything kind of shuffles around. And that's actually a normal thing, because remember, we're dealing with like millions and billions of years here, which is a um, you know, long, long time ago. Other interesting things that can happen, and here's an example. Um, we have Triassic and Jurassic Age strata that happen to be located um, in Nova Scotia, okay? Um, and sometimes you get lava flow on top of them. And so you just have to realize that as you're going and looking at the strata, you have to consider the lava would most likely disintegrate anything, okay? But if you're underneath that, you're usually safe for fossils, okay? So again, considering lecture, you could talk about, you know, what questions can be answered using fossilized data. You can talk about how fossils are formed. You can talk about radiometric data. And you guys have tons of time, by the way, to think of this. I'm just wanting to get your brains going and get you start thinking about what are you really interested in and um, what would you like to do your project on. Okay, so this is one of two lectures that I'm going to load today. 
um, for, and this is, of course, is going to be for Monday. And um, yeah, we'll start again soon.